Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Jamil Huck. I'm a professor of history at Minnesota State University, Deep Valley. Today I'm reading to you from Tibbs House. Tibbs House, as you may know, lacks a turret, but even worse, it is not full of chocolate. As a historian, I like to look at old documents, and what I have in my hand today are the documents related to the purchasing and sale of Tibbs House. Now, you may know that the Muller family is actually the Gerlach family. And it was Henry Gerlach who designed uh, dozens of buildings around Mankato. He was a, an architect. And this was his crown jewel. Uh, there's some debate as to when the house was actually built. Uh, my best guess is 1893. Uh, it is in 1891, on October 26th that uh, purchasing the house from Carl, the property from Carl Dice and his wife, Ida, Henry Gerlach and Minnie Gerlach take possession of this property. So in 1891, they would have then perhaps started building the house and then uh, I believe the house was completed in 1893. This house has not had uh, very many owners and the next owners are the Just family. Uh, the Just family will purchase the house in, according to these records, 1907. Again in October, which is interesting. October 23rd, 1907. So although uh, the Gerlachs probably did not continue to live in this house that entire period, they did still own the property until 1907 when they sold it to uh, Theodore Just. Now, the house has been through significant changes. So we're most likely sitting in the front parlor or the back parlor or the dining room. You can see this would have been the original chimney area, although this would not be the original chimney. Uh, the chimney still uh, for the house goes through this uh, corridor behind us. However, uh, they probably would have had a fireplace here. The house was originally designed so that if you lit a fire in the basement, there are different vents in different bedrooms upstairs that would have taken the heat all the way up. So the burner is actually still downstairs in the basement where you would have shoveled the wood that they used to make their little playhouses and or coal in. Chapter 14, Tim. They approached the chocolate colored house from the rear for it faced on Pleasant Street. On the back lawn was an oak tree which stood on a small knoll. On the knoll they saw what looked like a clothespin standing prongs up. It was a little girl, standing on her head. She righted herself when they came near and stood on her bare feet. She was dainty and small. Her arms, legs, and face were tanned, which made her blue eyes look even bluer than they were, and her short fluff of yellow hair look even more yellow. She stared at them silently out of her round blue eyes. What are you doing? asked Betsy. Standing on my head. What were you doing that for? I was practicing. It must be hard, said Betsy. Oh no, it isn't. The little girl looked surprised. Tacy didn't say a word. She was bashful. Betsy stared back at the little girl. It was certainly Tib. But my sister said you had a white lace dress on, she said at last. I took that off when I came home, Tib answered. I'm not allowed to play in my best dress. Neither am I, said Betsy. Neither is Tacy. I wish we could see your dress, though, she added after a moment. Do you? asked Tib, looking surprised again. I'll show it to you. She led the way into the chocolate-colored house. They went in by the back door. Wipe your feet, said Tib, pausing on the doormat. The kitchen was so clean, it shone like a polished pan. It smelled good, of something baking. A hired girl was standing by the stove. There was a swinging door, which led into the dining room, and another door, which led into a pantry full of glittery china and glass. The third door led up some narrow stairs, and up these, they followed Tib. Upstairs was a long hall with doors admitting to the bedrooms. Tib took them into one of these and hanging in the closet was the white lace dress. It's a beautiful dress, said Betsy. Tacy touched one of the pale blue satin bows. Tib led them down the hall. There were front stairs as well as back stairs. They went down the front stairs and just as the steps turned at a little landing, they came in view of the pane of colored glass. The afternoon sunlight streaming through it turned it ruby red. T 
Stacy and I love that colored glass, said Betsy. What colored glass, asked Tib. The colored glass over your door. Oh, do you? Why, asked Tib. She looked at it as though she had never noticed it before. We like your tower, too, said Betsy. What tower, asked Tib. Do you mean the round room? That's our front parlor. They crossed the hall and entered it. It was round and beautiful. Hanging over the piano was a picture of an old man giving a little girl a music lesson. The chairs and the sofa were draped with blue velvet, and there was a bamboo table draped with a blue silk scarf. The table held two little china dolls, a shepherd and a shepherdess. Tip led them through blue velvet curtains into the back parlor. There was a window seat from which you could see the red brick schoolhouse. A lady sat there sewing. She was short and chunky and had yellow hair, black tips and earrings in her ears. Is this the little Ray girl, she asked. Yes, ma'am, answered Betsy. I'm Betsy, and this is Tacy. Tacy held her head down and covered her face with her curls. Well, I hope you children will be our good friends, Tib's mother said, smiling. Mama, said Tib, may we have some coffee cake? Yes, said the lady. Matilda will give you some, but go eat it outside on the knoll. So Matilda, she was a hired girl, gave them some coffee cake. It was hot out of the oven, and they sat down to eat it on the knoll. Tib kept staring at Betsy and Tacy with her round blue eyes. She looked awed and admiring which was nice, but very strange. For Tip was the one who danced, thought Betsy. She was the one who had a white lace dress. She was the one who had a house with front and back stairs and a tower and a pane of colored glass. Betsy and Tacy looked at each other. Both of them looked surprised. They hadn't expected to like her, but they did. Tib didn't say a word and neither did Tacy. So at last Betsy said, when you came to our house, we were up on the big hill. Were you? asked Tib. We climbed to the very top, said Betsy. Did you? Tib replied. There's a little hill too, said Betsy, with a bench on it. We eat our suppers there. All by yourselves? asked Tib. All by ourselves, said Betsy. And Betsy makes up stories, said Tacy. It was the first word she had said. Do you mean, asked Tib, that she tells about Cinderella? No, I make them up, said Betsy. But how can you? Tib asked. Why, I, I just do, said Betsy. Tacy helps me. Will you make one up now? said Tib. Yes, if you want me to. I'll make one up about you and me and Tacy and that pane of colored glass over your door. Tib was speechless with astonishment, but Tacy jumped to her feet and said, Let's go. Let's go up to our bench. That's the best place for stories. So she took one of Tib's hands and Betsy took the other, and they walked through the vacant lot and up Hill Street Hill. And they walked while they were busy talking. We've got a piano box we play in, Betsy said. And Betsy's got a baby sister, Tacy said. We play paper dolls, said Betsy. And store, said Tacy. We dress up and go calling. And Betsy makes up games. Tib held their hands tightly. She sighed deeply with content. I'm glad I came here, she said. I like this better than Milwaukee. Betsy and Tacy stopped still. They looked at each other, their eyes as round as Tibbs. She liked Hill Street better than Milwaukee? Well, they had always known it was nice. After a silent moment, they went slowly on toward the bench on the hill. We'll have lots of fun, said Betsy. You and me and Tacy, lots of things will happen. And so they did. The end. Thank you everybody for visiting with me at Tibbs' house today. I hope you enjoyed your time as much 